Okay, thank you. We are going to have a little exercise, so you need to pay attention, all right? And we're not handing anything out until right before the time, because I've taught long enough to know you won't listen to one word I say. And I thought before we do a mapping exercise, we need to actually tell you what this whole project is about. And then when I do the follow-up with some of the findings, it should all make sense. So the overview of this project, it, it did take a village. It's still taking a village. We have so much data uh, that we don't even know when we'll finish. We have doctoral students now doing their dissertations using our data. Uh, this was funded by JISC in the UK, by OCLC, by Oxford University. Uh, my colleague Dave White came up with this visitor's residence framework, which is basically, um, I don't want to say going against, I guess it's challenging this whole digital natives, uh, digital immigrants, uh, because we're saying that it depends on the context, the situation, and we're finding that age isn't the major variable of why people are engaged with technology, and we'll talk about that later. And then at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, um, I think her name was mentioned several times, Donna Lanclo, and it was because of Stanley, who um, is here today, and he was at UNC Charlotte, invited me to speak. I was watching Donna collect uh, data, mapping data with students, and I, he said, you need to talk to her, and that's how all of this came together. And we wanted to identify um, how individuals engage with technology, and then how they get their information and why they make their choices. I am the only librarian on this team besides Aaron Hood. So of the, of the principal investigators, we have someone, Dave, who's into educational technology, Donna, who is an anthropologist, and so we were looking bro more broadly than libraries. Of course, I always had to get the library in there in some way, but we never imposed libraries or librarians uh, on our participants. Now, I, I mentioned this framework, and you'll see this is trying to depict that we're usually not one or the other, and that we may be one, we may be a um, visitor in this uh, environment, and what does that mean? It means that we have this functional use of technology, we um, often link it to a formal need. We're less visible, um, maybe more passive online, uh, more likely to favor face-to-face -face interactions. Then we have the residents. Uh, they have a significant online presence and usage uh, of these social media, uh, blogging, tweeting. Uh, they have um, a very high level of activity. They contribute to the online environment. They um, upload materials, photos, visitors. I always say, if I'm at a conference, I'll often tweet. I haven't tweeted at this meeting because I'm madly changing my notes because everybody's saying everything I wanted to say. Um, and Stanley's nodding his head, and I'm sure Joan is saying the same thing. Uh, and so I haven't tweeted a thing. So I always say to people, don't follow me on Twitter because I'm boring. And the only time that I actually tweet is when I'm at a conference. And so now I'm not even doing that. Facebook, I'm much more visible. Um, I'm much more a resident. The problem with that is I try to, to keep my personal and my private and, and my academic life separate. But I don't know if I've just gotten so old that everyone I hang out with is part of my professional life, but it's all mixed up now. And so I have no individual presence between the, the personal and the academic or, or professional. And so this is just basically what I just said. Um, the visitor mode, they look at the internet as a toolbox, as a tool. Uh, the internet for the resident is a place. Okay, it, and when we developed our code book, you'll see when I show you examples that the internet was coded as a place. Now we came up with these um, educational stages, and we came up with these lovely names, which 
I wish we wouldn't have now because I can never remember them. Um, but it's very easy to, to use them when writing about the project. We came up with emerging, and that was that late um, secondary school, last year of high school in the U.S., first year undergraduate. Establishing was that uh, second or third year undergraduate in the U.K. In the U.S., it could be second, third, fourth, fifth. Um, embedding is the postgraduate or graduate student, as we say in the U.S., uh, a doctoral student. Experiencing your scholars, your faculty, your researchers, your lifelong learners. And uh, I probably, I guess I assumed you would know that since we had Dave White with us that it was um, a U.S.-U.K. study, but I, I need to reiterate that. We had four phases. It's a longitudinal study, and some people were talking about longitudinal studies today, and this is one of the reasons we have so much data. And we did semi-structured interviews to start with, and we had 73 individuals in the U.S. and U.K., and we did them face-to-face. -face. Now, for a qualitative study, 73 is pretty large. And um, Donna kept saying to me, stop. You know, when can we stop? We have too many people. Um, you know, we can do five. I said, uh, that, that, that quantitative side of me is saying, no, we can't. Um, and we do have a lot of individuals. The, the, we had to pay them, hence the funding. Uh, it was very difficult to get people to talk to us without something in return. Uh, we talked to them from anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. It was face-to-face -face because we wanted to follow them for another year and a half to two years. And so we had to have that, that rapport, that trust. And so that's why we did the face-to-face. -face. The diaries I'll talk about a little later. We took um, a, a, a subset of these 73 individuals and asked them to submit diaries to us every month. Now, I wrote a, a research methods book, and I talk about diaries, but I forgot to read that chapter. Because when we did the diaries, we talk about the ugly, that was the ugliest. And um, I'll get into that with the results. We had written diaries. We had four videos, and the, it was um, someone in the US, and he was wonderful. He had rap music, and he made up his songs, and he told us what he did that month, engaging with technology and getting information by singing and dancing. Um, and, but he was the only one, a U.S. Uh, uh, second year undergraduate student who did that. Um, most of them uh, sent, uh, just sent us this one sheet of basically nothing. So we had to go back and say, you need to answer some of these questions every month, and, or you can talk to us, you can Skype us. Most of them uh, opted to talk to us. Uh, if they did send them to us, they sent them an email. When we asked why they sent them an email, email is part of the academic experience, and they viewed us as part of their academic experience, so we were not one of them. Then we went back two years later and interviewed 12 uh, of the last year uh, high school, secondary school, first year undergraduate, because we wanted to see if they had some of the same behaviors and engagement with technology as those who we, we interviewed two years earlier. And so we went back and did more, more interviews. And then that quantitative side of me said, oh my goodness, we probably have an anomaly. We may not have um, something that we can generalize. And so then we sent out an online survey trying to ask the same questions in an online survey that we did face to face. And when I talk about those results later, you'll see that you don't get the richest data from the surveys, even if you ask the same questions. We also did not want to, um, to probe a lot. We did not want to give people ideas, because when I talk about our code book, you'll see that the code book emerged from the information that we collected from our participants, as Denise had said about hers. 
these are some, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this, but th this is how it all broke down um, with our, uh, our, inter uh, our interview participants. And then these are our diarists. And we collected these for two years. So again, we, we do have enough data to support several doctoral students, which we're doing. And then um, in our third phase, we um, interviewed these other 12 uh, individuals. And then we had the 150 of the online survey participants. Uh, now, uh, this is a mapping exercise that we do. And you'll see that you have the visitor on one side, the resident on the other, your personal and your institutional. And um, as I said, when I'm looking at um, Facebook, mine would be blurred as a resident between that personal and, and that institutional or professional or academic. Now this is, um, and it's hard to read and don't worry about it, there are a bunch of quotes and you'll get enough of those with the findings. Uh, but uh, this is one, and that stands for a UK undergraduate student. And he was a first year undergraduate student. And you can see when you look at this mapping, now he did not do this mapping. We took the data and did this mapping manually. And so you will see that there's a, a clear division between his resident modes of engagement, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a she, and her personal life and visitor modes of engagement for study. And so um, she talks about uh, engaging with systems and materials not provided by the institution to do her academic work. She consults Wikipedia to write a, um, an essay. Aaron is smiling, I see. Um, uh, also, um, we talk about user-owned literacies. And so she developed her own uh, ways of getting through uh, our systems and getting the information that she needs. Uh, this is a US, and this is a high school student. And this is an example of someone who's predominantly engaging in visitor modes of engagement. And um, the quotes illustrate that he does use the web regularly for his studies, but he is not interested in being visible online. Now, when we talk to screenagers for another, a different project, uh, and that's that 12 to 18 year old group, and that, that term was not coi coined by us, unfortunately, it was by uh, Rushkoff. And uh, the screenagers were very nervous about being visible online. Uh, and they didn't want to talk to a librarian online. Uh, because one of the quotes was, how do I know the librarian isn't some psycho serial killer? And when you think about this, <laughs> we are, no. <laughs> um, when, when you think about this, you think about what we teach them. We teach them not to interact with people they don't know in this environment. And so they are listening, they just interpret differently. <laughs> Um, this one is um, an under, um, a U.S. undergraduate student, highly resident. I connect, he, uh, this is um, a male, he's connected to friends, family, and study. Um, he's on, he says he's on 24-7 with his smartphone. Uh, he's, he's willing to friend his other students on Facebook. Uh, that's, that's very common for him. Uh, and uh, Facebook is very important for him in this uh, quadrant for being um, the resident and institutional. And we found that a lot with these um, undergraduate students. And my colleague Dave said, I think they're just all cheating. And I said, no, they're sharing, they're collaborating. Um, but they will say, someone's always on Facebook. No matter what time of day, we can get someone to help us. Now, 
I mean, I'm not even going to, these are multiple maps. I'm just giving you some examples because you're going to be doing your own. Um, but these are some of the maps that we've collected over time. Um, we've done some of this work, um, Dave and Donna and I have worked with some universities. I've worked with some, um, they have done a lot with higher ed, not just in the libraries. I wear the library hat, so I've done a lot with university libraries and librarians having them map themselves, having them map how they think their students are behaving, and then actually collecting data to see how their students are behaving. Uh, so there are lots of ways that, we've, uh, that you can use these. This is one map that we received, very low residency, as you can see. Um, I want to know how you have a life like this, and I want it. <laughs> Um, this one is very um, compartmentalized, and so uh, you can see the professional and personal Facebook accounts. Again, something I was not able to master. Uh, this one, you see the Google, uh, Google appearing um, in that, uh, and you're laughing, yes, you can look at a, a lot of these, um, what the, the Twitter, and. They get very, look at this. Now, isn't this lovely? They, they, people start explaining to us um, and drawing. And they're actually, the, uh, the, the, math, the explanations, the annotations are really helpful for us when we're coding. Uh, this also has lovely annotations. Uh, and individuals telling us, you know, this can be institutional, you know, it can also be personal. Uh, another one with some annotations. I'm just giving you some ideas here. Um, just some others with some annotations. And now we're going to make a map, but I'm going to leave that to uh, William. And William's on our, our team, and um, he is doing some wonderful things with trying to develop apps and trying to take some of our data and plot it so that we don't have to do it manually. So I'm going to turn it over to William. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, let's make a map. Here we go. Um, it turns out our friend Clippy is going to try to help us as we go. Uh, uh, Clippy says, it looks like you're trying to create a visitors and residents map. Would you like help? Yeah, Clippy, I'd like some help, please. Uh, step one, draw horizontal and vertical axes. Okay, here's our pencil. And there's our horizontal and vertical axes. Uh, I'm glad that there's some appreciation of wordplay among the librarians. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, Clippy is not having any of this. And I won't uh, do the origami um, transition here. I took that out at the last minute. Uh, so here's our horizontal axis, and here's our vertical axis, okay? Um, and we're gonna label the horizontal axis visitor to resident, and we're gonna label the vertical axis um, personal to institutional, okay? Now you have a substrate on which you can draw your map. The next step, uh, you can kind of do this or not do this. I found it useful. I made a list of everything that I found useful um, uh, that I was gonna draw on my map. So I just made a list of all the websites that I use, and then I decided how I was gonna draw those later on. But if you're you know, a different kind of personality, maybe you just wanna start drawing things right away. So here's a list of my engagement with the web. I use Google Search quite a bit. That's probably my number one online tool that I use. Um, I'm a software developer, so I use GitHub. GitHub is like a uh, online collaboration system for developing software, open source software usually. I read a lot of journal articles, so computer science articles, that sort of thing. Uh, I publish articles every once in a while as well. I read a lot of computer science blogs. It turns out that computer scientists disseminate a lot of their information through blogs, so you can get a lot of important information through those channels. I check email, especially during work, and I write email. I have a personal website. I use Google Groups for connecting with other software developers. I also use a tool called Gitter for interacting with software developers. And I read something called Hacker News, which I don't know if there's an analog for uh, the librarian community out there, but it's uh, just kind of a, a news feed that's relevant to people in technology and, and computer science. And I. Uh, you know, go to YouTube to watch kitten videos, and, um, and then I, of course, you know, do the usual shopping and purchasing and paying bills. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about how I use each of those services, and I'm going to plot each uh, mode of engagement with that service using uh, some kind of box or region or shape. Um, so 
I typically use, you know, rectangles, but you can make little puppies if you want, you know, whatever you like. So my first um, service that I use most is Google Search. And I use this, you know, for personal search as well as, um, you know, institutional search. So when I'm at work, I use it all the time. Interestingly, um, when I use Google Search, I want get to get in, get out, nobody gets hurt. So I don't want to leave a trace of myself. So my mode of engagement is exclusively visitor mode. Okay, I don't have a Google account that saves my search results or anything like that. I just want to use it as a tool and not leave a trace of myself. The next tool that I use is email. Um, you can see that my institutional use of email is very broad, okay? That's where most of my email usage goes. And I do use email personally, but not very much. I'll send maybe an email or two a month. Um, and then uh, journal articles. I do a lot of personal <laughs> journal, journal reading. Um, a lot of it's uh, work-related, though, too. And here's something interesting. Uh, Clippy says, it looks like you have two different modes of engagement here, and I do. This is for GitHub. If you recall, GitHub is the uh, sort of online collaboration tool for software developers. So I have kind of two different modes of engagement with GitHub. One mode is work-related, which you can see in the lower left quadrant, and that's you know, all in the institutional quadrant there. I also have a personal GitHub presence where I have several personal projects that I've developed, some when I was doing my PhD in computer science and others just you know, as side projects. So it's okay to have an arbitrary number of, of regions. You can even have your regions overlap if you like doing that. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I uh, <clears throat> do read these computer science blogs to stay up to date on what's going on in the field. And that sort of spans you know, the personal interest with the uh, professional interest there. But when I'm reading these blogs, I typically don't comment. I'll comment every once in a while, but mostly it's reading. So my mode of engagement with that is more of a visitor mode. So you'll see it on the left. Gitter is, it's like a chat room that, that hackers or programmers use to communicate with each other. So if we're trying to figure out how to use a certain piece of software or a library, we'll go to Gitter and we'll just start asking questions. And we get responses you know, very rapidly from, um, you'd be surprised who would respond to your questions. You get questions from, you know, the people who are, who are writing these cutting edge pieces of software. So it's a really great way to collaborate. Um, also, I use uh, Google Groups to get in touch with, with um, programmers and software developers. And Hacker News, this is sort of, you know, trying to stay up to date, you know, reading the news feed, seeing what's going on in the technology world. So that's primarily, you know, visitor mode. I don't comment that often. And it's mostly personal because there's a lot of, you know, silly things on there about, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's shoes and, and what have you. And um, most of my, um, my residential uh, mode of engagement with the web is through my personal website and my LinkedIn profile. My GitHub profile, I still update it, but um, mostly it's kind of stagnant. But my personal website and LinkedIn are, are um, up to date. And finally, YouTube and the kitten videos, uh, those are mostly visitor mode. I just like to watch the kittens. I don't like to comment about how cute they are. Um, and it's you know, clearly personal use. And then uh, shopping and bills, I, I didn't really want to go there. Um, but that's, that's right up there with YouTube. Um, one thing I did leave off here is Wikipedia. I use Wikipedia quite a bit. It's probably my, um, it's probably second place in terms of, you know, most, most used, second only to Google. But I wasn't sure if I should put it up here because I have a PhD. And, uh, but apparently it's okay to use, to use Wikipedia. Things are changing. So that's good to hear. And that's it. So um, uh, we would like you to, um, I'll let Lynn go ahead and give some instructions. Okay, so we, we passed out the, the pieces of paper, so feel free to get started on your maps. Um, and if you would like to share these with us, you're welcome to take a picture and email them to this email address here. And if you want to be attributed, you can you know, put this information here in the body of your email. Um, if you want to be anonymous, that's fine too. So have fun and let us know if you have any questions.